Hi, I'm Danny. And I'm Alex. And we are seriously nerdy about a lot of things. Like Polly Pockets. <laughs> <laughs> So I was a big fan of Polly Pockets when I was a kiddo. I had a Polly Pocket ring and a Polly Pocket necklace and collected all sorts of these amazing makeup compact inspired toys that were a thousand percent a choking hazard for children of the 90s. I still remain a big fan. Really into choking hazards for kids in the 90s. But we survived the 90s, so joke's on you, 90s. Gotcha, 90s. <laughs> Fight moves. I don't know what that was. I wouldn't have done much. So our inspiration for this series is Polly Post a Pocket, where we take the stories and themes inside original 1990s Polly Pocket compacts, we bring them to life in sort of end of the world scenarios. Fallout, 1950s post-apocalyptic bunker. Mary Shelley, steampunk inspired Frankenstein end of the world. Frozen wasteland. Blade Runner inspired. Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk. Post-apocalyptic. Zombie apocalypse oh, yeah. will be in there somewhere in some shape or form. If you have any ideas for these, don't leave them in the comments. No, please don't post any suggestions. In the I know comments. what you're thinking. I've got a great idea or I have a, a suggestion. We really try to save our comments for our haters. There are a lot of them out there. We want to hear from them. What did you hate about this? What was the worst? Yeah, those yeah. things should be the majority of the comments. This is the internet, guys. Yeah, trolls or nothing. Thank you for your understanding. Like and subscribe. Smash that like button. Smash it. The first Polly Pocket we nabbed was a cafe. Bright pink exterior, bright yellow interior, and apparently the owner lives just above the cafe in two stories. So as we thought about the type of person who would live above a cafe, we started to formulate sort of a story here. So we know we have upper living quarters, a cute little door that opens to a shiny cafe, but how do we turn that into a post-apoc world? And that's when we realized it doesn't have to be a diner. It could be a bar. So in this post-apocalyptic world, this is now an underground bunker that was once part of an army base. And the owner, is now a proprietor, much like Rick from Casablanca, serving drinks to all the people in this post-apocalyptic world. Step one, obviously, was to mod podge and paint all of the paper surfaces to keep that from warping, and then start to color block out over these very vibrant Polly Pocket colors. So you'll see I base coated everything in a dark brown, and then just sloppily blocked out these sort of army base-esque colors so you'll see some green, some tans, a rust. Now there's a short time when I thought I would do a lighting effect here, but then I realized it would be much more interesting from a visual perspective if I didn't rely on any of the sort of plastic-centric gimmicks of the Polly Pocket and instead tried to bring in natural textures and really points of visual interest that would bring these tiny environments to life. So instead of trying to convey anything with Zenithal lighting or special effects, what if we truly make it a tiny diorama? Let's bring in the texture of natural blanket. That was just a little piece of paper towel here that I mod podged on just to give us some wrinkles and some fabric texture. And then it was a matter of thinking through props. In this Casablanca post-apocalyptic world, maybe our owner post-apocalyptic Rick keeps plants. Maybe he dreams about a life before the apocalypse. Uh, so that sort of lended itself to how we thought about the very top story of this environment. Now there's already a tiny sink up there and I thought maybe that's an interesting place for him to keep his plants. Maybe there's still a little water trickling through those pipes. So I used little pieces of styrofoam and some cut paper just to make some sloppy little plants that might live in the sink here. I also wanted to think through some greeblies and accessories that we could kind of block in here just to give a little more infrastructure to this idea that this is an underground army base. Who is this person? Why does he live here? And how has he sort of outfitted his home? Taking a paper straw, painting it with some silver paint, and turning what used to be a light in this poly pocket into some sort of an exhaust vent or duct. I also brought in some paper clips just to add some extra pipes and really wanted to distress this up. So add a little patina, add some null oil drips, 
really imply that this space has lived a whole life. Little things like bringing in mud or dirt, just so nothing really looks clean or pristine is such an easy way to take this from looking like a shiny poly pocket into a poly post-apocalyptic world. These are just little sheets of tissue paper that I dunked in water and a little bit of Mod Podge, and they end up looking like scattered paper or newspaper. This is a shield from a skeleton army. Painted that up to look like wood so that perhaps there was a window behind this that he's boarded up to keep the monsters and the zombies out. Now you'll see here that I'm gonna add some very bright green wool that was meant to sort of suggest because we're underground that roots have started to grow through. They end up being a little bright, so you'll see me come back to those later and address them. And then all these little details for post-apocalyptic Rick's world, where he keeps his stuff, how he organizes it, and then just sort of the decay and dirt that has seeped in from years of neglect in this space. So for the sitting area here, I wanted to start thinking through that army base structure and taking a cue from Fallout, maybe that mid-century mint green would start to make an appearance. So this environment suddenly becomes aspects of the army base, sort of that army green and those concretes, but also those mid-century elements like patent mint sofas and the you know, sort of iconography of that era. And one quick way to communicate who this Rick person is, uh, is maybe through art. So I grabbed a travel magazine and looked for any time the travel magazine had very small pictures. So tops of buildings, vistas, little tiny people. And I cut all these out to potentially be posters or artwork. And I cut out way more than I needed, but I can absolutely see these being beneficial to future Polly Pockets. But in terms of Rick's story, I loved the idea that he is sort of trapped in this bunker as this bartender for a end of the world scenario, but he still dreams about what life used to be like post-apocalyptic Elsa. And uh, maybe these travel posters remind him of a simpler time. So after we distress this second story here, how can we start to bring this space to life? Now. One of the things I'm really passionate about is using the infrastructure of the Poly Pocket. So this is an existing picture frame here. I'm just putting a new picture in. You can see there's a plant over there in the corner. That plant's gonna stay there, but we're gonna bring it to life with some actual foliage. So it's honoring the structure of the Poly Pocket and just kind of turning, turning the volume up to 11. Even the TV down here, uh, we're gonna give it a little fake black and white screen using one of those photos, but I like this idea of honoring what the Polly Pocket originally intended the layout to be. So we were feeling pretty good about the second story, turned our attention down here to the ground floor, and put a little bit of pumice stone texture in, and then pulled these pieces from an old 1960s car model. These are all sorts of little you can call them Gak or Greeblies if you're sort of in the maker circle, but they're just these interesting shapes that originally would have made up a model car. But in our world, we needed to communicate that everything was retrofitted in this army bunker. So I just sort of glued them in spaces that made sense. And they just add some visual interest and, and imply that the space is functioning for areas that it was not originally intended. So I start to turn my attention to this ground floor and what the original Polly Pocket Diner used to be. So you can see there's all of these little plates and cups that are on the surfaces of the counter and the tables. I believe they were supposed to be maybe pieces of pie, little cups of coffee. There's definitely salt and pepper shakers. I wanted to paint those out with some details, but again, how can we elevate this original Polly Pocket and bring this post-apocalyptic world to life? An easy way to do that was to bring in more of that fallout mid-century mint green. And because we already had these brown tones underneath, any color that you paint over it just has some nice depth to it. 
there's so much that you can do with layers of paint that just imply wear and tear and age and just add a little bit of visual interest. There's also some cheats you can do in terms of lighting effects and making sure that there's color gradients that give a little more visual interest than, again, that original Polly Pocket where everything was just flat, bright yellow. Now, one of the things I love about the Fallout world is that there's so much poured concrete. I wanted to make sure we sort of paid homage to that and brought out these concrete textures for this whole environment. So you can see I'm gonna do a lot of concrete effects throughout. Now, unfortunately, while I was painting that concrete floor, I realized that the television set was bugging me a lot and that it needed something to sort of make that picture a little less protruding. So I used some scraps of wood here, cut them at 45 degree angles and made a frame that I can paint out and then use to frame the television set. And it gave a very mid-century, sort of 1950s frame to the TV, but it also hid my mistakes. And those are my favorite details to put in, ones that are visually interesting, but also serve to hide your mistakes. And a second way that I love to hide mistakes is throw a little uh, null oil or shading in just to give a little bit of visual depth, but it also distracts the eye and makes you think that uh, there's a lot more going on here. So we've made it to the concrete floor stage of this ground floor and truly painting over that sort of ceiling flat brown and that pumice stone texture with concrete gray really starts to sell this environment as that former army bunker. That pumice again is still there, it's really visible as texture, but that concrete makes you think that we're probably several stories underground. Now, speaking of army bases, we were able to pick up these adorable tiny pieces of terrain scatter from our local hobby shop. They're originally intended for World War I or World War II models. I believe they're ammunition boxes uh, and tarps for tents. Uh, but in our world, maybe they're supplies, maybe they're more bottles of liquor, uh, tablecloths, sort of things that post-apocalyptic Rick could deal or trade in. Uh, but one thing I found is that because they're so beautifully detailed and molded, they distract the eye from how simple all of the existing Polly Pocket shapes are. And it's just enough that it tricks you into thinking the entire model has that level of detail, even though only new additions sort of do. Another way I did that is with this beam that we were able to get at the hobby shop little styrene girder beam that when painted out with copper just adds a little extra detail. Now we were set on this idea of this is a post-apocalyptic bar. This is Rick's lounge. So what better way to do that than with these teeny tiny bottles uh, and again even more supplies. So crates of alcohol that Rick goes out and scours the wastelands for to be able to sell to his patrons. So all of these little accessories uh, sort of start to shape the world. One thing I realized as I embarked on this, let's start to prop it out with actual dimensional tiny things, is that sometimes the poly pocket doesn't close all the way. So it was super important as I added this beam, as I added all these tiny bottles, I'm constantly placing them temporarily and then opening and closing the poly pocket compact to make sure that it will still function as a poly pocket. It needs to be able to close in order to work for this project. So even this beam needed to be set back a little bit further in than I was hoping just to ensure everything closed okay. This is the point where I start to realize my beautiful intention of lining this counter with bottles of booze will not work because the compact won't close. So the solution is a little back bar. So I would have loved to keep that cafe sign and do something there, but the better solution was to use the space that I knew I had where the compact closed and create a little bar here. Now, in order to do that, I just put a little beam of wood and then brought in some more of those greeblies just for that visual interest of this space has been retrofitted and sort of turned into 
the bar that it is now. And it actually lends itself very nicely. It, it gives you some neat visual interest here under the bottles. It sort of implies that there's ducts and pipes to support all of these teeny tiny bottles. That's right, I got even more bottles because now I have a back bar and I need it, you know, well and call. Even at the end of the world, it's important to have premium liquor. Uh, so painted these little tiny plastic bottles out with some inks and browns and yellows and greens. Continuing to reinforce here that this is sort of a subterranean bunker and baby can't get enough of gack. So that back bar needed even more junk to hold that shelf up. But once everything was stuck and looking cute, we could get our bottle on and uh, really start to place these little guys. Now in the outside world, it's a little muddy, it's a little gross. And that's when Danny realized, hot damn, there's windows in the door. Uh, so in order to keep the monsters and the zombies out, I used a little green stuff paste just to block out those very cheerful poly pocket windows and give me a more solid door. And as I was staring at said solid door, I realized maybe they would need to barricade it. And this is just another example of adding tiny props that tell stories. So took little pieces of wood here, stained them with brown paint very quickly, and then cut them into tiny poly pocket two by fours uh, that maybe could be stacked by the door. And if patrons come in and give the signal that there's trouble outside with the end of the world threat, uh, everybody can come in and use these spare boards to uh, keep the door closed. Little tiny visual interest, but it makes for a good story. So it was bottle time and I knew it was gonna be easy to place the bottles here on the back bar and that they wouldn't keep the Polly Pocket from closing. The trickier part was placing the bottles on the countertop and making sure that they don't run into the top so if you look, when the compact closes, these bottles could be nudging up against the TV set or against the bed up top. So there's very strategic placement of all of these bottles to ensure that when the compact closes, nothing is gonna get cut off. And then of course, because Danny can't leave anything alone, I realized that the sore thumb of this project really was this bright green moss coming from the ceiling. So I got realistic, dark green moss, which blended the same aesthetic. There's clearly some sort of a subterranean leak coming from the ceiling here, but instead of that bright green, clearly wool from the ceiling, uh, this moss just gave a, a better effect. And again, just wanted to make this feel like a lived in rundown world. So little PVA glue, little scraps of paper, even more distress. Uh, just reinforces this idea that this is a very lived in world. And it's one of my favorite things, you know, in a before and after Polly Pocket environment, this is so much, so much dirtier, <laughs> so much more uh, character and distress. So our little army door is now reinforced and window free. That iconic army green painted a, a little tiny plaque. People know that go to Rick's place for the best booze at the end of the world. And then my finishing touches as always are, are just kind of looking at the space overall and figuring out what needs a little more detail or distress. And one of those realizations was something that always bugged me as a kid. There was no way to get to the upper floors of a Polly Pocket. Polly was always just really good at leaping stories. So we had this embroidery plastic and if you cut it out and carve off all these knobs on the side, it can in fact make a perfectly scaled Polly Pocket ladder. We had a ladder that we knew could get you from the second story up to the bedroom. I needed a ladder that could go from the cafe up and ended up getting pretty dang close with a shorter ladder that went from essentially the, the sink area up to the, the second story. So quick coat of metallic paint and a little non oil for distress here. And suddenly we were in ladder business. Mm. 
first ladder, easy peasy. That one fits, the compact's still closed. It was great. Second ladder went in. Oh ho ho, dear reader. This compact's not gonna close. She is null oiling like someone way too confident. Uh, so the solution was I carved into the little back bar shelf and ended up moving a couple bottles out and inset the ladder just enough that it would still close and clear that cash register down there at the bottom. So we were on the final steps. I made the decision that I didn't want the compacts to stay their original color, sort of paint out the inside with flat black here. Confirm that everything closes and fits securely. And then it was go time to go ahead and give it a coat of shiny silver spray paint outside. Is there anything more satisfying than super silver spray paint in hot summer sun? So suddenly what was the bright pink compact looks especially cool with that coat of silver. And fortunately, none of the spray paint seeped inside. So I went back to my old bag of tricks, pulled out some Agrax Earthshade, some muds, and uh, just gave this little baby a bit of distress to imply that it had lived a life. This is an old compact makeup brush, just to give this a little bit of dirt and decay, keep it from being too pristine and shiny. And then Alex suggested maybe there was something we could do to the exteriors of all of our poly pockets to help them stand out. So I thought maybe these little caution signs could have icons that tell the story of what's inside. So for very first poly post a pocket, this is Rick's story. So inside his caution symbol is a little tiny liquor bottle. So that is our first poly post pocket. Things we learned, things we did differently. Number one, have a plan. I think I repainted the cabinet four times, five times. I think one thing that I learned is bringing in surfaces that make sense into the poly pockets. It's such a plasticky world. Some things read really nicely, like wood or like the little tiny plastic bottles. Other things didn't read super well, like that organic foliage that was originally falling down from the ceiling. It definitely seems important to make sure that it can still open and close. Yes, the, the poly pockets have to be functioning. One of my favorite things is other than the set of bottles that I went and bought from our local hobby shop, everything else was sort of found objects or stuff we had or just cute little tiny small things. I love the idea of being able to upcycle and reuse household products to sort of turn them in and give them new life in a poly pocket. Thank you so much for watching our video. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope you come back and watch some more. That's right, we were gonna save the big reveal. We saved the big reveal. And now let's take a look at the final footage of our very first Polly Post a Pocket. If you're inspired to make your own Polly Posta Pockets, please let us know. Tag us on social media with hashtag Polly Posta Pocket. If you can spell it. That's why we're gonna put it right here. It's there? We put it there? Yeah. It's magic. <laughs>